Welcome to the second session of the Vikasat Conversations, which is titled as Immigration, Consumption Boom and Service Economy of Kerala. In an attempt to reflect on where Kerala stands to get today and Kerala's growth trajectory during the past three decades, the Center for Public Policy Research is organizing 2022 Vikasat Conversations supported by the Institute of New Economic Thinking, New York. On the topic, 30 years of India's economic reform. Assessing the growth and development experience of Kerala. The second session will deliberate on immigration, consumption boom, and the service economy of Kerala. This session, this session is basically a structured as a discussion on the uh, on the theme mentioned before, and also it is followed up by a question and answer session from the audience. Now, I'm very happy uh, to welcome both our distinguished speakers uh, to the Vikasat Conversations. Let me first introduce myself. I am Sumita M, Research Fellow, Migration Studies at uh, the Center for Public Policy Research. and. We welcome you cordially to this year's second session of the Vikasat series. This topic of migration lies very close to my heart, both professionally and personally, because I've been associated with both the institutes, INET, Institute of New Economic Thinking, New York, and Center for Public Policy Research. Let's go into the professional aspect first. Professionally, I've been doing a lot of research on migration, on remittances, on the consumption boom for the past decade. So uh, both these institutes have featured a lot of uh, work, have done a lot of work on migration issues, especially related to the Kerala economy. Personally, I've been associated with the Center for Public Policy Research for more than 15 years now, and also has been an active participant in Vinet's YSI programs, which actually throws open a va uh, various uh, opportunities for researchers like us. Now, both these organizations, most of you might know, are very familiar to all of us. Let me just put in a word about INET. INET is an institute which encourages heterodox economics thinking, and therefore it, is, uh, it has a, group, a very uh, vibrant group of thinkers and uh, advanced thinkers, economists, uh, thinkers from different social, uh, other social sciences, and also promotes a lot of research in interdisciplinary areas. Center for Public Policy Research also does a lot of work on uh, redirecting public policy, which we late, which we, which is very important to give a right direction to our, our work. Now we have two distinguished speakers today in the panel. One is Professor uh, Dr. A. Arundhan, who is a uh, is assistant professor and researcher at the University of Gordon And the other uh, panelist is Professor K.P. Kannan, who is the chairman of the Laurie Baker Center for Habitat Studies. Uh, so uh, to talk about, uh, we are very happy to welcome both our speakers to the panel today so that we have a vibrant discussion. Dr. Arumban has, has worked a lot on labor issues and uh, recently he has uh, done a lot of work concentrating on Arab countries. His research work, uh, ha he has uh, had wide, uh, widespread research outside India and, uh, as a, uh, as a, and his work is being followed by all of us. So we are very happy to have you here, sir. Uh, Professor K.P. Kannan, as you all know, uh, is a very senior social scientist as a mentor and guide to many of us here. So uh, uh, Dr. Kannan has served as the director of the Center for Development Studies. He has also taken up various positions in government bodies and, uh, has, uh, and is a social scientist par excellence. So we are very happy to have them both on our panel. Now I'll just uh, take you through how, we, uh, how we, has, we have structured the event. So basically the event, uh, the speakers will go first. So Dr. Irumban will start off his uh, a session with a, it, it will be a 30 hour, uh, excuse me, a 30 minute presentation, uh, followed by the second speaker, Dr. Kannan, 
after which uh, three of us, there will be a discussion among three of us about the related themes or themes for future research. At any point of time, the audience is most welcome to type in their questions, which will be taken up towards the end. So this is how we have structured the event. Now over to you, Professor Erumbel, for your session. Uh, we hope uh, it will be a very fruitful and exciting debate. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, thank you, Sumita, for the nice introduction. And uh, I'm quite glad that uh, to know that you follow my research, even though I'm not a big migration expert. Um, Kerala had a very renowned model of development called the model of uh, Kerala model of development, which indeed had its limits as well. However, the public policy and initiatives in Kerala and several historical factors helped the state to achieve a better living standard compared to the rest of India. Since the late 1970s, Kerala's economy has been supported by remittances and you know, as a migration expert, and all, many of you know that, primarily from the Middle East and also elsewhere. Gradually, due to several factors, the economy has shifted from a farm-based economy to a service-based economy. Today's discussion is all about this transition and the reliance on migration. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abdul Erumben. And as Sumita said, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And I do a lot of research on the Indian economy from the perspective of productivity, structural change, global value chain, digital transformation, and the impact of these aspects on welfare in comparison with other countries. First of all, I thank CPPR and INET for inviting me to this discussion. Um, and more importantly, I'm quite glad to share this space with Professor K.P. Kannan from whom I learned quite a lot from CDS about the macroeconomics of India. Also, I understand that um, the previous session, the first session was with Pulapre Balakrishnan, who also contributed to my journey in the world of productivity, along with Professor Pushpangadan, who also does quite a lot of research on Kerala economy, both from CDS. So I thank again, thank you, Arun, Thanuraj, Sunanda, Anu, and Claire, and all the participants uh, today for facilitating uh, this uh, today. As I said already, I'm not a migration expert and I do very limited work on Kerala. So my reflection, and this was a very short notice and also, so my reflections today are going to be primarily based on my research on the Indian economy in the global context and some recent work on the Middle East and Africa from the perspective of productivity and structural change. Can you see my slides actually? So I, I, I'm not sure about that. Yes, yes, it's visible. Okay, let me put it in the presentation mode. Yeah. Is that better now? No, it's fine. Okay, good. So first, let me give you uh, an overview of my primary observations in today's discussion. In case if Sumita stops me for one of time in between, I do not want to lose any of the main uh, points. First, I think there is a lot to worry about Kerala's economy, but that is not necessarily due to the service sector's dominance or reliance on remittances, but the environmental vulnerability of the state, the short-sighted nature of our policies without considering the global trends and the local needs and fragilities, the attitude to jump into the construction of infrastructure and technology without considering the appropriability of these technologies to the state's geography and climate, poor integration of service sector into value chain, national and global, due to poor orientation towards the right sectors within the services. Frankly speaking, I'm not quite worried about the service sector per se. I think that is a benign and inevitable transition for Kerala, given its unique demographic, social and economic characteristic. I will explain that. I'm also not quite concerned about the migration and remittances and the reliance on that per se. Kerala has been 
historically globalized and that will continue. However, the lack of local incentives leading to a substantial brain drain that will affect innovation and entrepreneurship in the state, politicization and other weaknesses of our educational system and still existing social exclusion are some of the major concerns for Kerala. Indeed, the population of Kerala is highly educated. Still, the question is whether our education and the needed skills are complementary and how flexible our uh, graduates and our students are to get into the modern labor market needs. I think we need smart and productive enterprises that are suitable for Kerala's geography. Kerala is a wonderful place. Whenever I say to my colleagues that I'm from Kerala, the first question they ask me is that, why are you here? Here actually, because they, whenever they visit Kerala, they all really love it actually. All that we need is to create an enterprise friendly ambience for locally appropriate industries. I really stress that aspect. And if, if we slow in that process, that will make us miss the boat. So that is the main story that I'm coming up. So now I'm going to place this whole debate about Savitization in Kerala with the help of some numbers. Compared to other states in India, Kerala was already tending to become a service economy in the early 1990s. We are also looking at the economic reforms during since 1990s here, right? So the economic reforms in India, the liberal market reforms may have triggered that process in Kerala, but that shift was already happening. So this chart basically shows the share of service sector jobs in Kerala compared with other states in India in 1993 and 2019. The orange ones are for 1993 and the gray ones for 2019. And I have uh, circled Kerala in the chart as you can see. As you can see, only a handful of small states or union territories were ahead of Kerala in servitizing the economy in the 1990s. And that is still the case. Most people in Kerala work in the service sector and only a few states outpace Kerala even today. Now, in this chart, which is a follow up of this last chart actually, I have the distribution of employment and GDP. So the left hand side, you have the employment distribution and on the right hand side, you have the GDP distribution across sectors in India and Kerala over the last quarter of a century. This is taken from a paper that I am currently working on with uh, some colleagues uh, from the Reserve Bank of India. So both GDP and employment show somewhat similar pattern and similar picture, but I personally would like to look at the employment distribution. That is where people are actually ultimately, right? I mean, if you, if you can have a high uh, share of GDP from a particular sector, if that sector has very high productivity, but if the sector is not employing sufficient people, its impact on welfare will be very limited. So what do we see here? Service sector is expanding in Kerala. You can see that the share of service sector employment, uh, which is the gray one in here actually, that is expanding in Kerala much faster than that is happening in India. Both agriculture and manufacturing are shrinking, but this is again not unique to Kerala. This is the case in India in general. Interestingly, we also see that the construction sector is also expanding in terms of job creation in Kerala and also in India. Here, there is also another interesting aspect which I have not marked here in, in terms of the chart, which is that close to 70% of all the service sector jobs in Kerala are market service sector. That is activities such as trade, distribution, transportation, business services, etc. The remaining 30% are in education, health, government services, etc. So clearly, what we see is that the market-based service activities are driving job creation in Kerala, along with construction sector, while other sectors like agriculture and manufacturing are uh, losing out. So this is really happening, and that pace has been accelerated since the economic reform, although it has already started prior to that. So with this background, uh, I'm also providing you uh, what we, we need to ask, okay, what is the implication of this shift to services for economic growth? And this is a little bit technical, but I will explain to you uh, what it is actually. So in this chart, I have the productivity defined as the volume of output an average worker in Kerala produces in a year. 
on the left hand side we have the productivity levels in different industries or sectors in kerala compared to the national economy at the all india level a relative level so all india is the uh, 100 here and then compared to all india what is the kerala's productivity level what you see is that so there is a line on there which is 100 which basically means that if any sector is on that line which may, means that that sector has the same productivity level as all india level in kerala in all the sectors kerala has high productivity compared to the national economy right now and except in mining and utilities these are anyway not big sectors in kerala and we know that uh, electricity sector for in india is uh, you know a public sector for example we also see that the agriculture sector has lost its relative productivity levels but all other sectors have improved their productivity levels uh, from the since 2004 now on the right hand panel i have the de- have the uh, labor productivity growth rate or the changes average annual changes averaged over this period in the productivity levels uh, over this period which i have decomposed into two different components so the productivity growth rate over 93 2004 is the first bar and 2004 to 2018 or the since 2004 onwards is on the right uh, part so i decompose this overall productivity growth into two components it's a bit technical i'm not going to the technical part but i will explain to you what it means the first is a productivity improvement within industries so that is whether agricultural manufacturing and services sectors are improving their productivity and whether they are contributing to the national uh, state level productivity growth the second is a bonus that we get from the shift in the economy or the stru- change in the structure of the economy uh, or the shift of workers across sectors for instance the increasing servitization of the economy whether that enhances or reduces economic growth and productivity so that is what the second part so now what we see we see is that the upper bar the, which i have marked here in the, with the blue line you see that service sector is the largest contributor to aggregate productivity growth in kerala that has been growing very fast in terms of productivity since the 2004 period the second largest contributor to the aggregate uh, state level productivity is manufacturing sector both service sectors both, both manufacturing and services sectors have improved their productivity growth substantially over 1990s agriculture and other sectors which includes construction utilities and other sectors contribute relatively less compared to manufacturing and services so that is the within industry productivity growth so that we see that there has been productivity improvements in services and manufacturing sector now what is what is also interesting is that at the lower part which is the uh, dark gray part which you see here which i have marked with a blue line and that is also positive in both periods what does that suggest this suggests that the expansion of jobs in the service sector is actually not damaging economic growth and productivity in kerala rather it is enhancing productivity growth this is quite important because famous growth economists like danny rodrick have observed that in many african countries the change in their economic structure is actually growth reducing that is hampering their productivity and economic growth and that is not what we see in kerala this is also the case with many arab economies we found in a study which we did for the international labor organization recently that many of arab economies are also seeing a growth reducing effect from a structural change or the shift in the labor across different sectors so what we conclude here is that the so called servitization of kerala economy is not that bad purely purely from a growth perspective that brings us the question do we really need to worry about servitization of the economy that is not a simple question there is no simple answer to that question also if we ask that question in the context of in the larger context of india where more than 40 percentage of our workers are still in agriculture and a a major chunk in the informal sector where uh, productivity and wages and welfare is relatively lower the boom in high skill services in the economy 
may mainly create some kind of spillover effects and very limited positive and inclusive welfare impact. Because a large proportion of workers are in India are semi or unskilled who cannot be easily absorbed in the high skilled services sector, and they can only benefit from marginal or the secondary impact of the service sector growth. I mean, and of course, they can be employed in the informal services, which is not paying very high, which can lead to inequality, for example. But, uh, but, the, but, but in, in such case, for example, small and medium enterprises and manufacturing jobs may be more appropriate. But even then, as we all know, the national economy is struggling to attract manufacturing investments and create jobs in the manufacturing sector. So the economy is still moving into the service sector in terms of uh, output growth. And also, I mean, a lot of people are still employed in the agricultural sector. Now, Kerala, a state which is relatively more educated compared to other states in India, with only about less than 10 percentage of total service sector workers are less educated, with relatively high wages, and with very dense population, the question is that why would we imagine, dream, and aspire to create typical smokestack industries to create jobs? We don't have to, and we cannot. When you take the reality in our federal setting, anyone who would think of location choices of manufacturing firms in India may easily disregard Kerala compared to any other states. Unless any of the factors that a private firm would consider hampering their competitiveness is compensated by productivity. So we do not have to worry much about it, in my opinion. I think Kerala does not have the potential to expand the typical smokestack manufacturing industries, and we should not be striving to do so. Manufacturing is also changing, right? I mean, manufacturing is not the same as what we used to think about manufacturing in the past. Uh, the service content in the manufacturing has been increasing substantially, creating more and more opportunities to service, provided we are integrating with the global and national value chain. The possibility of fragmenting different production segments, both within and manufacturing and services, is amazingly huge in the, in the, in the current context. So there comes the global uh, picture. So personally, I think I have written about this uh, in uh, prestigious Brookings Institution's uh, future development series. Uh, personally, I think the future of the global economy lies in the digitization of societies, which will eventually lead to the globalization of services, not manufacturing. And I will show you that in a minute. And the early beneficiaries of that where would be those who equip their human capital, their people, to embrace service globalization. And I personally believe that Kerala has all the potential to go in that direction. Now, let me show you a few charts that establish what I am trying to say here. In this chart, the blue line in this chart is the trade in manufacturing as a percentage of global GDP. And the yellow line is the trade in man services as a percentage of global GDP since 1995 till until 2019. I did not take beyond 2019 because of the COVID fr frictions, the normal trend is uh, being affected there. First of all, what you see is that the trade in manufactured goods has declined as a percentage of global GDP since the global financial crisis. Of course, the global financial crisis have caused a significant decline, but even after that recovery, you see the trend is declining in the global manufacturing trade as a percentage of GDP. A number of factors uh, can be, uh, we can identify a number of factors for this decline in the, in the global trade, including the rising populism in the Western uh, countries, uh, trade war in, between the United States and China, the anti-globalization sentiments growing uh, in, the, in the Western world, Brexit, advances in technology that really facilitate the shift in production more closer to consumers rather than going somewhere else and so on, whatever it is. And I, I personally think that the COVID-19 is the final straw in the long chain of events uh, that really uh, deterred the manufacturing globalization to this uh, downward uh, trend. But at the same time, the yellow line, you also see that this has not affected the global trade in services. You see that that is still continued to grow. And I think 
this clearly give you a indication that the trend of global integration is likely to diverge between services and manufacturing and i'm going to show you uh, that with uh, another picture which is more interesting uh, to look into so this is again a complicated calculation but i'm not going to that but what i'm going to tell you is that uh, this is about production fragmentation so what i mean by production fragmentation as you know production of manufacturing products is highly fragmented now if you take any product today anything which is on your table right now it will have its parts produced somewhere else right i mean the product the final product is assembled somewhere but every part of that is produced somewhere else in the in the in the global economy so production has been highly fragmented and uh, you know this has also helped to many countries to participate in the global value chain and to contribute to global value chain so in the production chain has been so fragmented that way but the interesting thing is that on the left hand side you see that that trend in the fragmentation of production is also declining since 2011 onwards so that basically means that the foreign inputs used in the domestic production of manufacturing goods are declining in generally it is declining but the manufacturing goods are declining more rapidly again a number of reasons have been highlighted for this trend in the literature uh, including the shift of businesses from uh, from the business perspectives from uh, efficiency orientation to more resilience and flexibility i mean uh, i'm pretty sure that you all hear about all the stories about uh, intellectual property protection in china and companies are moving from china back to vietnam or uh, to united states or to, or to germany and so on for instance i'm not going to the details of that but whatever the reasons are so this is actually happening so the there is a decline in the global fragmentation of production countries are increasingly increasingly sourcing their supply from the same country where they are being produced so again on the right hand side you can see that service fragmentation is not falling at the same pace as that is happening in the manufacturing sector so that again you really see a difference between manufacturing and services in the way production fragmentation has been happening so what all this makes me conclude is that the potential for this is also not my simple conclusion uh, richard baldwin in, in his 2016 uh, book has clearly described a lot of uh, theories and lot of you know scenarios around this so the potential for service globalization is relatively high for a number of reasons actually for instance right now if you look at although Three fourth of workers in the advanced economies, United States, Europe, and all other advanced economies are in the services sector, but its trade is only one third of manufacturing trade. So that there is much more potential to increase the globalization of services. This is despite the fact that many tradable activities are now part of services, and these activities have a high employment share in advanced economies. And after COVID. Firms and households are increasingly adopting new technologies that can facilitate service trade. Remote working makes it possible for anyone with the technological infrastructure to participate in the global value chain and foster small scale businesses and production and also increase participation of female workers in emerging market economies in the service activities. There is also substantial wage differences between uh, countries in the service sector across countries in the service sector which will create a lot of potential for uh, service uh, integration across countries and outsourcing of more and more services uh, to other countries finally one point which i missed i'm just thinking about it which i missed to indicate here is that services are also likely to be less amenable to standard trade barriers such as tariffs and quotas until we invent new forms of uh, barriers. I mean, of course we will invent, but at the moment there is an advantage that uh, it is much more easy to trade services across the globe. So that is, uh, so I believe that the potential for service globalization is much more and Kerala has the potential to uh, tap that opportunity. Now, the second uh, topic of today's discussion is uh, migration. Um, The, the, in, the, in, the, in the context of migration in, uh, from the perspective of Kerala, uh, we do create human capital workers in Kerala. 
that can be employed elsewhere. And this is sometimes we argue about a lot, but I don't really think that is a bad thing. Uh, for I, I will explain the reasons. We have been doing this historically. I mean, the people who work in the migration statistics and the history of Kerala knows that we were in Ceylon. We were we went to then we went to Middle East when the oil was discovered, and now we go to the West. We we are in Africa. We are in China when there are opportunities are emerging in those countries. We are everywhere, not in Mars yet, but we will be there soon also. So and and some of these countries require more people. Actually, let me show you a picture right now. There is a lot of discussion in the Western economies at the moment about future labor shortages in many occupations and industries. This picture is a symbol and very small simplified depiction of the current situation. So this is basically the number of vacancies per unemployed person as a ratio. You see that the number of vacancies available per unemployment person is higher than one in, in a recent years. That is for every unemployed person, there is more than one job vacancy available in Europe and in the United States. This suggests the already looming labor shortages in Europe and the United States. Barring the global financial crisis and COVID-19 related declines, the trend in the opportunities has been clearly and consistently upward and firms are finding it hard to get the right people. Companies are talking about retaining talent as they are expecting a global hunt for talent in the coming years. So we do not have to really worry about this. I mean, it is not a bad thing that we are exporting human capital and we have been doing it historically and we were successful in doing that. And we are quite flexible in, in, in that actually. But another concern that recently we have seen uh, in the is the flight of many migrant workers from the Middle East countries back to Kerala amid their job nationalization policies. Since the discovery of oil, uh, these GCC economies have created a kind of segmented labor market where migrants have been dominating the private sector and the native workers in the very unproductive public sector with very, very high wage premiums. But it has come to a saturation point now that that model is no more sustainable as the population of GCC economies are growing so rapidly. Women started working and they started participating in the labor market um, and the demand for more jobs for the locals are increasing day by day. Oil prices are highly volatile. We know that this is very unstable and the hunger for alternative fuel is rising globally, which is again threatening their distribution model, which they have been following uh, for, his, for, for long time uh, since the discovery of oil. But the question is, is that nationalization policy easy for these economies? We did a work for the Kuwait Science Foundation lately and the conference board. And what we found is that it is actually not really easy for to implement the job nationalization policies, at least for the private sector, because one of the objective of this economy is to privatize their economy and to increase more privatization and create more opportunities in the private sector. And why that is not uh, easy for the private sector? This picture, which is from a report we recently submitted to the Kuwait Science Foundation, shows that migrant workers are about 70 percentage more productive than the native workers across industries in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. While their wages are only 20 to 40 percentage of the natives, that is much, much lower, they are more productive, showing very small unit labor cost for the migrant workers. Clearly, this indicates that the private sector will not find it easy to go for nationalization unless these cost differences are compensated by productivity. These countries can provide some incentives at the moment, but that is not sustainable because they cannot continue providing subsidized, you know, uh, subsidies to private companies to employ the local workers and then pay, keep paying them very high wages because these are small economies and the why would com companies, especially multinational companies, will be engaged in employing, creating opportunities by employing uh, locals uh, by paying very high wage if their productivity is uh, not uh, compensating for their higher costs. So that will re really need upskilling the local population and also continued reliance on expatriate for many jobs 
including several uh, high skilled complementary jobs in these countries indeed that does not mean that there will not be disturbances there will definitely be some disturbances but that is not going to be the end of the world and there are opportunities opening up elsewhere in the world so there is of course there is some worry but i think that is not you know completely uh, going to make kerala fall off the cliff so my conclusion is that there is nothing wrong with being a service economy the concern that migration is ending uh, and kerala will be in trouble is also less realistic what we need to realize is that the tradeability of services has increased productivity or and potent productivity potential has uh, of the service sector has increased it is as much as manufacturing sector it provides opportunities to create high and medium skill jobs it is tech intensive less polluting and we also need to realize that we are not alone in this race a lot of african countries are moving into this for like rwanda kenya south africa they are all trying to embrace this service where already uh, you can see that that is happening in these countries what is wrong is that we are not asking ourselves whether we are harnessing the right services are we able to contribute to the rest of the indian economy and the global economy by participating in the national and global value chain are we developing infrastructure skills and capabilities that equip us to compete in the global and national value chain wherever we have the competitive advantage we need to think about industries that are suitable for kerala right i mean they are really not smoke stacking uh, manufacturing industries and uh, how to align ourselves with the national policies for example many national policies uh, regarding uh, export policies and exchange rate policies will have implications for the state enterprises we need an attitudinal change that encourage innovation and entrepreneurship in the state especially considering the young generation so servitization and migration are not necessarily the main concerns uh, the question is whether we are checking the right boxes i don't have the answer to that question of course uh, someone really need to look into that uh, in detail and identify those factors but definitely what we are doing may, doesn't appear to be in the right direction always so i'm going to stop this uh, conversation uh with a quote from a recent paper by joseph stiglitz which i'm leaving it here i'm not going to read out but which basically claims that manufacturing cannot help economic growth anymore the way it did in china and east asia but it will be the services of which developing countries need to be much more aware of many things i have indicated some of them and in a recent paper that myself and my colleague hates and defries we did for the united nations we empirically observed that the shift to manufacturing did not help to reduce poverty in many african countries so actually it did help to reduce poverty in some of the east asian economies and china but that is not doing the same magic in african economies so basically because many of the shift to manufacturing sector has been to low wage sectors and uh, informal sectors which are not creating welfare effects and poverty reducing effects thank you for listening to me and i look forward to your questions and i sumita i really think that i was in time thank you very much thank you so much dr rumban that made my job pretty easy because you are spot on on time and it was a very interesting presentation i'm sure a lot of questions will follow up so just a reminder to the audience that questions are open to you at any po point of time you can type in the questions and we'll take up towards the end of the presentation it was a very positive presentation and i guess uh, it will uh, set the stage for the next uh, speaker welcome dr uh, kanyan uh, over to you sir uh, first of all i am sorry for being late i had an emergency to attend to and anticipated shocks like the ones arumben has a forecast for the world economy but household economies are also subject to uncertainties and exogenous shocks secondly i think i am in a better position now having listened to uh, i will call him aziz i will take the liberty instead of calling him an unknown name dr a a erumban so aziz's presentation makes my 
presentation, uh, I think, much more easier. So I'm going to share my screen. Now, let me just start by making a few somewhat sweeping statements. But as far as Kerala is concerned, it's a state economy, it's a regional economy. It's not a sovereign national economy. That makes a big difference. We tend to uh, compare with countries uh, and the region. Sometimes it's not methodologically fair because Kerala doesn't have the economic sovereignty to take its own decisions. So subject, so it is basically the Indian economy that provides the economic sovereignty issues and background and within which you can maximize your effort and economic development. And that is possible for uh, the most large countries you have subnational states which are fast growing, some are very slow growing. California, for example, in the United States is a leading economy. And in China, there is, you know, Southeast China is much more dynamic than the uh, Northwestern China. So I'll start with that assumption. Kerala has gone through a continuous record of human development ahead of all India and major states since the formation of the state in 1956. In several specific indicators of human development, uh, India's record is behind Kerala by more than a generation, 30 years, for example. If you take a uh, demographic transition, infant mortality, under five mortality, literacy, and a whole range of human development indicators. Kerala's HD human development record has not only surpassed major states in India, but also most countries in East and Southeast Asia. High human development induced high economic uh, growth with a lag through labor migration and remittances. Educational advancement calls for special mention because of its foundational character in moving a human development. However, quality of higher education continues to be a big challenge for Kerala. Now, I'm giving an example how uh, the educational attainments of Kerala may be can be compared with all India. For example, if you take the working age population, which is very important for understanding the performance of an economy, if you take secondary level school as a threshold for calling being called an educated person, and secondary and above, uh, Kerala had, uh, <clears throat> uh, among Kerala adults, it was 18.5% in 1983, as against 163 for all India. That increased to 56 or 57% in 2018, as against 46 for all India. The gap has widened. And if you go a little higher and you take consider only graduates and above, uh, Kerala was 2.3, but India was slightly higher, partly because Kerala graduates tend to emigrate much more disproportionately, and therefore you find this. Uh, in 2018 also, whoever remains in Kerala, we get only around 13% people who are graduates and above as against a little more than that for all India. If you take the younger generation of men, you can see this, it is much higher both in 1983, but much more higher in 2018, that is currently. So you can say about 68% of Kerala adult men are now educated if you take secondary level as a threshold. So it is an educated male labor force, both employed and unemployed. Graduates is all close to 20%, uh, which is slightly more than the national level. But I put a star to say that this is because 
this should be close to 29% if you go by the women's rate because women continues to be less mobile, internationally speaking, than men. So women's, what is the achievement is much more interesting when you look at women in Kerala and all India. Whereas, you know, you see in 2018, adult women between 15 and 59 years working age, 58% had at, the le at least a secondary level education that is 10 years pass, whereas it was only 34% for all India. And for graduate, it is close to 18% against 10%. For younger generation, 73% of women, adult women in Kerala, have at least a secondary level pass or above. And for graduate and above, it is 29%, whereas the national average is 15%. So if you consider men and women, women in Kerala outshine women in all India in terms of their own educational attainment. And the threshold levels I have taken is fairly high, a secondary level pass. Whereas usually it is, it is taken as literacy or five years schooling and all that, uh, putting up a very higher threshold. Now, <clears throat> I made a statement that Kerala now outranks many Southeast Asian and South Asian countries, including its own country, All India. So this is the, what it happens that the 2000, if you look at just 2000, the recent data on Human Development Index, Kerala comes second rank in this list of 12 or so countries. It's just below Malaysia, but higher than Sri Lanka, Thailand, China, Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, India is at a lower level than Bangladesh, Myanmar, Nepal, Pakistan. And percentage change and the rate of change is also very impressive. So one could say from a human development point of view, it's amazing that Kerala has reached such high levels, middle income country levels of human development. In some respects, it is closer to European and American levels like in ex life expectancy and infant mortality rates and things like that. So that gives you a rough idea of the nature of human development in Kerala society. Now, I now come to the, you know, um, immigration, out-migration of people. I'll come to its uh, process a little later. But just to show you that there has been a secular increase in outmigration of adult people. I should say here, adult male. Kerala's international migration is dominated by men, 80% men, 20% women. In that 20% only a mostly marriage migration, although they also go and work there since they are educated. Uh, otherwise, like uh, hospital services, nurses, medical, paramedical staff, uh, unmarried girls also go due to historical connections and reasons where they feel secure in their international movements. Otherwise, I must say Kerala women's ability or mobility to be mobile is still restricted by conventional norms. What you find is a slight decline since 2013. This is just after the, a few years after the financial crisis. Uh, and, uh, but more due to internal reasons, which I will show it later, that the low skilled and low educated migration has come now more or less ceased because the labor market in Kerala is able to uh, give a much higher wage to the unskilled labor. So there is a shortage of unskilled labor in Kerala for manual work. And sometimes the net saving that one can get by working in Gulf countries is lower than what you get as wages within Kerala. So many construction workers now prefer to remain here. So there is no push migration, mostly pull migration of educated people. I'll come to that. 
But what is interesting about this, although the total number has come down, the amount of remittance has not come down. That strengthens my point that the per capita earnings have raised because of higher levels of education and consequent earning capacity. And this is the earning, uh, the remittance figures that I'm showing just to take out the annual fluctuations, which are normally there for several reasons, especially exchange rate reasons in a more or less not a fixed exchange rate, which used to be the case till 1990. But now the blue line is in rupees and the red line is in US dollars. Both are increasing. So the, there is no decline in the average annual flow of remittances. And this might come as a surprise to many because during the first US invasion of the Iraq and consequent uh, conflictual situation, many people returned from Kuwait uh, fearing their life and selling all their assets. So the, in fact, the remittance increased because they brought back all the assets they have. But interestingly, within a year, they could go back because conditions were stabilized and they even got reparations from the Kuwaiti government. So in a way, they were, they were compensated for whatever temporary loss. Secondly, even in the second uh, Kuwait in the um, US war on, uh, on, on, on Iraq, that also did not result in uh, any permanent decline in uh, emigration, because that also proved to be a short term. People came back whenever there was a, a conflict, but they could return. So the net migration was always positive till 2013. This is what why the, the, I, I told you the qualitative uh, change in the out migration. In 1998, that was the first time the Center for Development Studies did a comprehensive household survey, sample survey, to understand the migration patterns and characteristics. And then the graduates were less, less than 4%, 12% higher secondary and about 39, 40% secondary level. So you could see this, but now what you get is in 2018, that's about uh, 20 years after, graduates in Devo constitute almost 31%, 10 times the, almost, well, seven times, um, the 1998 figure, 30% of them are now at least 12 years of education, at least these are lower thresholds uh, and secondary level 30. So 90% are educated workers. Only 10% are less than secondary level, um, which used to be 40, 52 um, plus 4, 55. 45% used to be less than secondary, now it's only 10%. So which is an interesting um, point to note. What does remittances mean? Remittances mean they are income from outside to the household economy, not to the public uh, exchequer. So, but remittances we can see in a macroeconomic sense as autonomous injection of outside money. Normally for a regional state, it is not considered or estimated as part of the state income, but I will do that just to make, to show you the difference between domestic income and domestic income plus remittances. It, it did impact because then you are injecting outside money that creates effective demand for goods and services and also raising your savings. So it was a consumption led growth process because these remittances became significant only by the uh, second half of the 1980s. As I have shown the graph, the secular increase in uh, both remittances and people. 
and that resulted in increasing consumption. And by 1991, there was national level economic reforms, neoliberal economic reforms, which gave a floating, more or less floating, managed floating uh, exchange rate. So people also could get a windfall effect. So this year the rupee is 20 rupees, next year it is 22 rupees. So you get a, the same dollar, you get more Indian rupees. So in a way that produced a, a heightening of the consumption and Kerala emerged by 1994 as the uh, highest per capita consumption expenditure state in India boom in consumption that led to a new phase of growth, which I will show you what this is beginning with 1987. Increase in household savings that did not lead to a significant increase in growth in commodity producing sectors, but boosted growth in services. We will come to that. That is partly because uh, Aziz had mentioned that, you know, the traded and non-traded division was important and I think it is continues to be important despite service emerging as a traded sector. It will take some more time for fully feeling uh, the impact of that. But Kerala's uh, labor market uh, went through a major change. This graph is to basically show you the trajectory of growth and 86, 87 as more or less the roughly uh, the turning point in taking off to a higher growth path and 98, 99, a further acceleration. Now, <clears throat> if I show you, you know, this is the one where, you know, uh, you, you, you try to get the um, Kerala's growth performance. Um, I divide it by in, in terms of two phases. The first phase of low growth is between 1960 to 87, almost three decades, 27 years. And then the takeoff period from 1987 to 2020, around 33 years, you find the difference. NSDP is the net state domestic product that is without including the annual flow of remittance. Okay. So from 2.6, the growth rate jumps to 6.8. But when I include the, this is called the modified state income. I include the, um, I add the remittance, annual remittance money to NSDP. Then the growth rate changes to 3% and to 36.9, more than double. The Indian economy also has a similar experience, but its first phase was not too bad, not as bad as Kerala, 3.6 to 7.1. So in a way, the national policies also helped Kerala because Kerala was well prepared to take advantage of the globalization and liberalization to a limited extent, to the extent of reaping benefits out of remittances, not necessarily in attracting investment, either domestic or foreign. Now, what is more interesting is Kerala's per capita income growth is much higher than all India in the second phase, 6.2, 5.3. This is because Kerala realized an early demographic transition because by 1990, Kerala's total fertility rate uh, came down to two children per couple, whereas Indian average was close to three or so, or 2.8 or something like that. So because of the early demographic transition, Kerala's per capita income growth was much more impressive than all India. And that's an interesting fact to note. Now, when you look at the sectoral performance, you will find here that uh, the primary sector continues to experience a very low rate of growth, annual rate of growth, 0 0.7, 0 0.9. Um, All India is somewhat better, 2.1 to 3.4. 3.4 for primary sector is not too bad for the country as a whole. 
but Kerala is, is disappointing. Secondary sector, Kerala 4.3 to 6.5, but I'm not going into the details, but I think uh, as is also mentioned, it is not due to manufacturing, it is due to construction. The secondary sector includes construction. It's almost uh, overwhelmingly contributed by construction. Um, for all India, it is slightly better than Kerala, but not too much different. Um, service sector is the one Kerala outshines um, in the sense from 4% to 8.8. .8, and if I include the remittances, it 5.1 to 8.6 as against 5 to 8. India, was, uh, India is also going through a similar uh, experience of service sector led growth, but Kerala is much more dependent on the service sector than the Indian economy as a whole. Now, the importance of the remittance sector is very crucial here because uh, if you take all India, the remittance to Indian economy, you know, it's not even two or three percent of international equivalent. Whereas in Kerala, it was uh, in the early period, it was negligible. Then it rose to 12%, uh, then 23%, 13% in equivalence to the state domestic income. If you take the government's uh, general uh, expenditure, then it was again by 2000, it, was, it exceeded the government expenditure not general expenditure, government expenditure. It in increased, it, it exceeded government expenditure in some period, but the latest is, is almost close to 70%. Value added in manufacture by 2000, by turn of the century, remittances exceeded the income generated in the manufacturing sector. By more than 100% here, now it is 50% more. Similarly, the value added in industry, but is both in construction and manufacturing. Value added in agriculture, so it exceeds the income generated in both the material producing sectors of the economy. So you can imagine the importance of remittances, both in terms of the uh, domestic income generation as well as government's ability to spend money. <clears throat> you don't have to spend much time on this except to note that remittances have been increasing. The annual growth rates of remittances, both in dollars and rupees, and per immigrant, uh, total bank deposits, domestic deposits, non resident external deposits, that means foreign exchange deposits of Kerala. It's, all these are a very remarkable or impressive growth rates. Now, if I may say so, there are not a lot of positive aspects and negative aspects. The negative aspect, for want of a better word, I put it as negative aspect, labor market and factor market disequilibrium led to a continuing lopsidedness in economic growth in favor of the non-traded sector that is construction and services. First, when you have such migration of people, the total number, let me first say, although uh, Aziz was gaga about Kerala, it's being everywhere except Mars. You know, Aziz, the 90% of the Keralites are now in Gulf countries. Only the remaining 10% are distributed in the rest of the globe. So we are there. Uh, in most parts, but in tiny numbers. But really, Kerala's labor force now is in Gulf. And that accounts around 15 to 20%, depending on the year that you look at, of the total workforce in Kerala. Okay? So that's a very important. It disequilibrated labor market in the sense the shortage of uh, unskilled workers in Kerala raised their wages to such an extent that agricultural profession became less and less profitable. 
for many of the marginal and small farmers and most farms are marginal or small. Secondly, the, 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 the price of land has shot up. So when land prices go up, not due to demand for agriculture, but for demand for construction. So land is shifted away from agriculture to construction sector. So people have been selling their land to prospective builders. And the stage has come now, there is a net decline after a long time. Earlier it was crop shifting. Now there is a net decline in the area sown uh, for agricultural crops and land prices have gone. So if you factor either the implicit or explicit value of land and the wage cost of agriculture, your profitability is so low that it's better to purchase agricultural grains and other vegetables from the nearby states which, have, which offer you competitive prices. So there is no incentive despite government schemes, subsidies, the incentives are not sufficient. And there is no, there has not been so far technological breakthrough in agriculture, partly due to structural constraints of small size of farms, but also partly due to the strong trade union object, uh, objections. And trade unions are a very powerful institution in this state. So in a way, they objected to technological change, both in agriculture and manufacturing, wherever the, it resulted in job loss. At the same time, they also bargained for high wages. So naturally, this can, this can only be absorbed by reducing your profitability. But if this is a regional economy, if I'm a prospective investor, I would rather go to the nearby state where both land prices and labor wages are lower, so I can get higher profitability. The only way to uh, change this situation, as uh, Aziz mentioned, is through a productivity breakthrough to such an extent that it should overcompensate my extra profits from you know, if I locate it in neighboring states. That has not yet happened in a significant sense. In some, there are recent technological or new technology-based industries coming in, but they are not large enough uh, to make a big difference in the contribution of the manufacturing sector. So this resulted in job loss uh, for the economy as a whole. And the job loss is due to not a straightaway uh, process of uh, jobs being cut down, but by a process where jobs of less educated people, especially in agricultural sector, uh, declined. New jobs were created in the construction sector as well as in the service sector. And in the service sector, the average levels of education needed is much higher than in agriculture. Anybody can work in agriculture as manual labor, but in services or teaching, for health, for trading, for finance, for travel, you know, all these, you need a minimum qualification. So the gain, employment gain was for the educated, employment loss for was the less educated. And, but however, the supply of, because of this, everybody wanted to get educated. Education has a very high social premium in Kerala society. First for its own sake, or the intrinsic, as Amartya Sen said, intrinsic value of education, and also for the instrumental value of getting a better job and better decent work conditions. So the supply increased so much that we now have basically educated unemployment, not less educated unemployment. Now employment generating capacity of this high growth is quite disappointing. And what I have done here is to work, work out the employment elasticity of, for each sector. And you can see primary sector showing a negative employment elasticity, which means that you know 
both growth is negative and employment is also negative. Declining industry, in the sector. Secondary sector, in the latest figures show a minus 0.4. So the employment law, net loss is much greater and the growth is not sufficient. Service sector also is showing somewhat you know, the negative employment elasticity. So what, what we are now saying is, you are growing very fast without creating jobs. And this is the jobless growth story. And I should say that this is not only true for Kerala, but India as a whole. I myself have done a lot of work on this along with my colleagues. And you can see the latest one I did was from job loss growth, jobless growth to job loss growth in the economic and political. If I give you a, a sense of the numbers of uh, people who have lost jobs in primary sector, between, if I take these two periods for which data are readily available, uh, 2014 and 17, that's about 13 years, agriculture lost a net loss of 26 lakh, one lakh is 100,000 or 2.6 million. Manufacturing is also a net loss, although secondary sector is a gain because of construction. You can see 0.7 million jobs, net jobs were created in country, but tertiary is the one which created uh, 0.5 million jobs. So all these three sectors together, because the job loss in agriculture is so high that you have a net loss of 19.7 lakh or almost 2 million jobs. The loss is more for women than men. That also you can see technological, such technological changes as have now happened in agriculture, especially in transplanting, harvesting, processing, etc. Have taken over, have been taken over by men, uh, whereas it used to be performed by women. But more than the unemployment resulting from this, what I am concerned is the unemployment is an artifact in the sense you take the number of people seeking work divided by the number of existing workers plus number of workers who are seeking work. And that is expressed as a percentage, you get unemployment rate. What about people who are not in work, but not seeking work? They are sorry to basically you. kept out of the... Uh, sir, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, in another two, three minutes, if you could wind up. Yes, I can wind yeah. up now, but you won't get the full story. No, 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 sir. Okay, um, so what I have done is to work out the uh, unutilization, uh, underutilization of labor, which is a measure which ILO has also recently come about. They are concerned about discouraged workers because they are not seeking work because the less educated people have no mechanism to seek work, unlike the educated unemployed. So you have a very huge um, percentage of people in the working age population, basically women, not men. Men have only see less than 10%, okay? You can see this for even for the educated category 15 to 59, only 9% men are out of work and out of education. Either you are in work or in education. If you are not, then you are you don't have a gainful employment and you may or may not be seeking work. 56% of our women, educated women are in this category. For younger generation, it is much higher. Younger generation, they have a long waiting period. Increasing inequality, uh, how much of it is induced by remittance is a matter for investigation. I wouldn't say it's all due to my remittances but this is an empirical challenge and needs to be investigated. Given the regional nature of the Kerala economy and the strong preference for service sector jobs of an increasingly educated population, the potential for a productive growth of the service sector deserves a serious investigation. This is what Aziz has been educating us for the last uh, uh, few minutes. And I'm sure he's one of the best persons 
to undertake this investigation because when you say servitization or servicization, what exactly or what could be the possible uh, growth path in that? Which are the sectors where you have productive service sector uh, opportunities for employment? And that needs to be spelled out. And I'm not very sure that the globalization will continue this, uh, the same way as before. In fact, it has already changed after 2008, both European Union and America, uh, especially after Trump has gone back on the, their own project of globalization when it hurt them. When it didn't hurt them, they imposed it uh, light, right, left and center through the World Bank and IMF. The IMF and the World Bank lost much of its credibility after 2008 because the medicine they proposed for recovery for uh, Europe and the United States was very different from the bitter medicine they prescribed for Asia and Latin America. It's a matter of worry. And now that Ukraine conflict has further <coughs> given a blow to the earlier neoliberal globalization. So I'm not. Uh, so optimistic as Aziz seems to be, but I think he knows better that uh, my feeling is that uncertainties are so strong that we, we could see a bipolar situation in uh, globalization, or you can say a, a bipolar globalization or regionalization within that bipolarity. Because there are now, because since financial instruments have been weaponized, this is creating a lot of worry among developing countries, although it is seemingly against uh, certain countries, but every country is now worried what happens if their foreign exchange reserves are frozen for one reason or another. So they are now regional currencies are, they are talked about, uh, new currencies are being, uh, or bilateral trade is taking place. So these things you cannot uh, rule it out. And my guess is, the story is going to be very different. So we may not be able to project from the past. Um, yeah, that's all. That's all, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was nice listening to you. Excellent presentation. Okay. Uh, now, uh, before we throw, uh, take up the questions, we will discuss certain common themes which uh, were overlapping in the presentation, certain themes which we can take for further discussion. So, uh, Professor uh, Professor Erungan, if uh, your presentation was on the service sector and how how much we can leverage on the growth of the service sector of Kerala, and uh, I was just wondering, like uh, Dr. Kanan mentioned, like how 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 can we make this growth path more productive? So we know that we have a service sector economy, a growing service sector economy. How can we create opportunities back home? Uh, because one of your slides mentioned that the nationalization policy in Gulf countries is now very different. So we have a lot of return migrant issues in the state. So how are we going to absorb this kind of labor back if, if at all there is an opportunity into the service sector? Would you like to respond now or? Isn't it better if we take more questions and maybe yeah. similar questions? Yeah. 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 Uh, now, uh, these are questions which we discuss among ourselves. I've not yet started uh, taking questions from the audience. Like in uh, another 15 minutes, we can take up questions from the audience. So this is one question which we had, our team had in mind, like because you've uh, done a lot of work on the service sector. Another question is uh, most of our labor policies have been framed, keeping in mind manufacturing sector, right? So uh, how, how, think, how well do you think have uh, labor policy been changed for the service sector? Or uh, how, how conducive is uh, labor policies? Or uh, what, what is the general uh, idea about labor policies back home when we, when we see the uh, service sector grow? Now, uh, also, I, we, we would like to know, like, which are the major segments among the service sector which can drive Kerala -like economy through, through its growth path, especially because you uh, showed a very interesting slide on the labor productivity, the two-phase division, which I really liked. 
most of the audience would have noticed that slide because it it, it was a simple slide which uh, had many shades to it now i have a question for dr kanan for many years we have uh, we have argued in popular media among academics that remittances uh, fueled economy is not a very sustainable model in kerala so does the aftermath or the consequence of covid 19 uh, this disruption uh, concur with this hypothesis or do we have another different conclusion that's one question to you sir and the second one is you have shown us how important remittances are in spite of the decreasing number of immigrants to the gulf we still have a resilience in remittances so would like we would like to know the extent to which the pandemic has changed the dynamics of remittances because we had a world bank study if i remember correctly predicting that remittances would decline rapidly uh, post covid but that has not yet happened so uh, is it because uh, so what are the uh, how has it impacted kerala's economy and also uh, one one passing remark that you made about consumption so i was wondering that till now whatever debates we have had we have had about kerala being a conspicuous consumption state and but there are, are there any policies existing or do we have any policies to be explored to incentivize productive investment yeah and then i have a common question to both of you that we know that private remittances are private income so you can't tell people how to spend it right so that is a major problem with remittances but how can state policies be incentivized in such a way that we use it for or we channelize it towards productive investment in kerala so these are some of the questions from the themes that we have discussed if we have further questions we can take it up but if you could sorry let me straight away I respond to these questions so that i can pass on the burden of the com uh, complex questions to aziz okay um first of all um labor policies in india labor policies is a joke in india the employment of indians indian workers 80% of them are in the unorganized sector where there is no um, hardly any employment policy or labor policy the remaining 20% now uh, 12% of the 20 they are informal workers in the formal sector okay so what you have is 8% of the indian workers working in the formal sector subjected to some employment policies or labor policies as as uh, non wage payments uh bonuses um gratuity social security etc so it's a very small one but that is not the one employers are worried about they are worried about hire and fire but what is the hire and fire labor policy in india the government of india's labor policy is that you have to um uh, seek government per permission to fire employees only if that establishment is employing more than 100 people now that threshold is raised to 300 that's a different thing and when i was in the national commission for the nine nine sector we worked out only 2% of indian workers are working in establishments employing more than 100 workers so what are we talking about so it's a it's a kind of uh, straw men they wanted to and they basically wanted control over labor no questions asked and that's now happening so there is no and labor the recent labor codes have considerably watered down or even the earlier small provisions and you can even make people work more than 8 year 8 hours now by state laws if the state decrees it so that's we are back to 19th century okay secondly remittance is not sustainable yes people used to say but that is casual empiricism we have had a, an experience of a continuous flow of annual remittances from the gulf countries from 1971 72 onwards half a century of uninterrupted remittance flow 
increasing remittance flow on per capita terms. Okay, so but despite the shocks of regional wars, COVID has twisted the situation. There is a report we we have not conducted any survey. The CDS is yet to. I don't know whether they are planning now. They have not yet conducted any post-COVID uh, Kerala migration survey, Kerala's. If they do, then we will know. But government reports suggest that a lot more people have come back. But that is not yet reflected in the Reserve Bank of India's remittance figures to India. All right? So that's it. I don't know why and what interesting factors are working there. There needs to be um, World Bank, maybe World Bank was looking at a number of countries, so there may be, you know, other factors or other countries, but so far this has not happened. India, okay. Policies for productive investment, as Kerala has been discussing that for a long time. The government is trying their best to attract investment, but just by giving soaps like um, some concessions or electricity subsidy, you don't get uh, industries like that. You, know? you need uh, you know, people to invest their money, hard-earned money, uh, and ability to take risks. So it's a much more larger challenge than a mere state uh, policy. For what are the state policies or what could be the state policies for uh, tapping the remittance, leveraging, yes. There is, there is much I have uh, written about it. I have talked about it. The first thing for the government is to increase their tax collection efficiency. Because when consumption increases, disposable income increases, consumption increases, then you are taxable, then uh, tax potential should increase. Whereas Kerala's tax efficiency, tax collection efficiency has a secular decline from 12.5% in 1970s and early 80s to 8.5%. That is, for every rupee spent in Kerala, government used to collect 12.5 rupees. Now it collects 8.5. During COVID times, it has reduced to 6.5. That means widespread evasion of taxes. Because if government has more money, then it could provide more incentives and more in, better infrastructure. There are also other uh, failure areas of you know large time and over time and cost overruns of infrastructure projects. So these things also put off uh, uh, people. So the government does its job very well, basic duties of collecting taxes and utilizing it effectively. Uh, because you, uh, budget allocation and expenditure is one, actual result is another. Because if I give you a figure, uh, irrigation projects take six times the estimated time and cost to complete. So if you have you know, 100 million rupees for a project, you end up with 600 million. If you uh, promise that it will be finished in four years, it takes 24 years. So I think the state's uh, failure in efficient economic management is one of the reasons in uh, our inability to translate remittances into more productive investment. Thank you. Thank you so much, so much sir. It's like more points to think about. Thank you so much. Um, would you like to respond? If there are, yeah, I can, of course. Uh, yeah. First of all, thank you, Kanan, sir, for making my life easy, especially in terms of the labor market policies, uh, which you are much, much more capable of reflecting upon. And I, I mean, most of the labor market policies we talk in the context of India is about the manufacturing sector. And as for Sir Kanan already indicated, um, we don't have much, especially covering the major segment of the labor force, which is in the informal sector. Uh, he's indicated 80%, and even that 80% is actually even higher in some sectors, actually like agriculture sector. I think there are differences across sectors when you really compare. And uh, uh, a while ago, we did the re we really did a kind of uh, study uh, whether 
that the transition from a formal to informal sector and then uh, you know equipping the informal sector to uh, technologically and uh, modify in terms of capital deepening and all that really helps improve their productivity and welfare actually so but we don't have a lot of policies oriented that i mean that still remains a dream for india and it is a huge dream and it's a big challenging dream for india now about the other questions uh, sumita you already indicated that you have been asking these questions for a long time that it clearly explains that how difficult those questions are to answer right and it is a very complex question and i said tell to said during my presentation i do not have the answers to that only some some indications first of all what can we do about the people who are coming back from the gulf Uh, and how you how our service sector can accommodate them i mean i do not know the uh, perfect answer to that question but and it is also hard to answer that question without analyzing the skill composition of those people who are coming back the question is that do we have a mechanism and a system that really track the people who are coming back and uh, you know seg segregating or you know identifying them what are they and what are their qualification what kind of work they were doing back in the in the middle east and you know that kind of a system i don't know whether we have in place so without knowing that i mean it's very i mean i can just tell okay you you employ them in this and these sectors but that makes no sense at all right so we really need to know what are they and who are coming back is if if they are all construction workers i mean construction sector in kerala is already booming so i really don't know actually so it really depends upon what kind of information we have and one really need to seriously look into that then only we can really say i mean i i come from a i'm originally come from a place in malappuram district where a lot of my neighbors are in the gulf countries and what i have observed i mean this is not i'm not coming saying this from the from a perspective of an economist but what i have observed is that most people who are coming back just going to some kind of unproductive business activity and that is just a kind of activity for them to keep engaged rather than to gain income so that is not very a productivity enhancing or welfare enhancing or contributing to economic growth so that is my that would be my vague answer to that question now uh, coming to the question of um, which segments of services can we improve and uh, uh, and uh, you know how we can improve uh, productivity of the service sector uh, i mean first of all again this is something which one really needs to look into uh, what are the advantages kerala has and which segments we have first of all we need to identify globally and locally what are the sectors which are uh, upcoming including for example we have all these sectors like many ict based services tourism uh, tele robotics and tele medicine all those are sectors where kerala have uh, kerala can you know um, elaborate its advantage but at the same time i also think that it is not just the responsibility of the government but also of the society i mean as um, rigram rajan recently wrote in his book the third pillar which is a society which is very important actually in this whole game we need to change right i mean our cultural attitude i mean our attitude to the business people the the people entrepreneurs and innovators and the social and cultural ambience that needs to change which is not very easy but i mean it is easy for politicians and you know people to say that okay we are all good and we need to we can increase employment but the, at the ground reality is that are we really changing ourselves we need to ask this all of us we need to ask this to ourselves and uh, and i am pretty sure kerala is doing a lot for example i think kerala is one of the startup uh, destinations one of the highest startup destinations in in india we need to promote that a lot of startups startups are happening in kerala we need to increasingly promote that and uh, identify which are the real sectors which can uh, trigger Uh, economic growth and cre create more and more job and th this does not have to be large scale sectors it can be small scale sectors because service the good thing about these kind of service um, activities is that it can be done at a small scale and uh, you know medium enterprises and small scale enterprises so so that would be my general um, answer to your question thank you
thank you so much uh, dr arambin that uh, yeah the skill component actually is very important plus uh, i think both speakers talked about the institutional arrangements in place right uh, where we need more efficient systems of management and as well as the point about how society should be more responsible and how our response should change according to the needs is very important now what i'll do is uh, to both speakers like i there are some questions from the audience so uh, like it's directed towards each speaker so i will read out wherever questions or uh, where, where as and when time permits yeah we have time so uh, so let's take there's a big question dr rumban are you tired <laughs> so uh, it's a paragraph but i will read it out for you uh, the uh, it's from uh, arun balachandran he says he thanks you for your talk and it's directed towards dr rumban he says while you point out that there is no damage in focus on service sector is well taken you did not make any mention on entrepreneurship in kerala so supporters of focus on service sector in kerala often use it as an argument to mirage the lags in entrepreneurship like for example he states a very recent example most of us have read that the move of sabu of kitex group away from kerala was seen as some national academics as a reflection of low entrepreneur support whereas the discussions in kerala was around why the service sector growth is more important to us than manufacturing would you like to take up that question or shall i read out some more questions for you dr arumbin fine i can i can briefly reflect upon that i mean i will not talk anything about the sabu and kitex yeah, yeah. which is uh, which has which has both political and um, yeah, you know yeah. academic component to that so i don't want to get into that no. uh, but definitely uh, this is this has to do with, i mean i i definitely did not uh, touch upon the entrepreneurship activity uh, aspect of this whole discussion but i i think i really indicated that kerala need to develop a pro entrepreneurship entrepreneurship attitude and uh, i also think that it's not only about the kitex or manufacturing plants but in general that attitudinal change needs to take into account the changes in the aspiration and attitude of upcoming generation and that is not the same as what my generation for example or professor kanan's generation or the previous generation that is totally different uh, my son or my i mean the you are all new generation kids are thinking totally differently and they they have much more better access to the global scenario and what is happening to the global economy and society they have much more access and exposure to that and they know and they have much more clear vision and we often overlook that vision of the new generation while devising policies and so on so th that aspect has to be taken into account while we are devising uh, policies to uh, you know incorporate entrepreneurial activities now given the what is happening in kerala i mean people accuse kerala for high wages i mean i really do not think that is a really bad thing i mean it is not something which government can easily fix as professor kanan earlier said kerala is an economy within the federal setting of india it's not a country i mean it's god's own country but it is not a country uh, from that perspective right so the pro problem is that so kerala has to, kerala within the as a state if you have high wage the high wage is a result of so many factors including our awareness education and uh, income for example and also relatively lower level of inequality i think i mean even though unemployment in kerala is high i think professor kanan indicated that i also have noticed that the unemployment is more among female rather than male actually because the male unemployment in kerala is quite comparable to other south indian states there may be some explanations about that i don't know actually uh, but female unemployment in kerala is very high but even though that is the case poverty and inequality there is a recent study by uh, i think one of our pre previous cds professors uday shankar mishra and if i remember correctly william jo in epw which estimates the asset inequality in indian states and kerala is the second after punjab uh, in at the lower bound i mean i think only 20 10 percentage or less than people are 
uh, I mean, very low amount of, I think, one percentage, if I even I correct, if I remember, at the lower 20 percentage of the asset, um, uh, you know, uh, endowment. So inequality and in, uh, poverty has declined in Kerala massively, and it is one of the lowest in India. So there is a lot of social aspect that really, even though unemployment is high in Kerala, there is the, the correlation between these as typical figures between unemployment and poverty is not very strong in the case of Kerala compared to other states in India. So uh, having said that, we are not promoting entrepreneurial activity. I mean, people often say that this is because of high wage. That is definitely a, a, an issue in the manufacturing sector, for example, because the manufacturing sector is highly uh, informalized and other aspects are there actually. But when it comes to services sector, if you can compensate that with productivity and Kerala has the potential to do that because people in Kerala are much more skilled and educated compared to any anywhere else in India and we can compete. And once other states reach to that level, definitely they will also, there will be some kind of equalization of wages. I mean, may not be perfectly, but there will be some kind of convergence. So I think we do have advantages here. So we need to change a lot of uh, our policy and attitude, but I, again, I did not do a lot of research on this. So I don't have the perfect answers to which are the, the pinpointing, which are the policies we need to change, but there is a lot to do. Um, let me say something, Sumita. I need to leave if there are no questions to me, because I have uh, something to urgently attend to my wife. Uh, uh, so I? Just, uh, so just one question, which is directed towards you. I will just read that out and you're free to leave. So it's just a question on Kerala uh, model of development. And Mr. K.V. Thomas asks you, that what is the what about the condition of marginalized or underprivileged sec sections? Any, what is your take on this matter? Uh, my take my take on this has been written about a lot of times. Yeah. And since this is not the theme of this seminar, I did not uh, um, elaborate on that. I'll make two statements. One is that um, they have made a lot of improvements in education, poverty reduction. Uh, and a whole lot of uh, human development indicators, but others have made much more improvement. So there is still inequality, but the process of catching up is a difficult process. So you say you raise your education by five years, uh, but the others uh, raising it by eight years. So you still have that uh, gap. Secondly, I want to say, so there are questions of, um, you know, pockets of, uh, deprivation uh, among, among basically among the scheduled tribes, Adivasis, that need to be attended to. Although they uh, form only 1% of the population, probably that is where we are lagging behind much more than among uh, Dalits and maybe uh, the, the fish uh, workers. Uh, secondly, I must also say that uh, um, the general condition of SCs and STs, marginalized people in, in Kerala, is better than other states. But that, that is not to legitimize our lack of uh, equality, okay? So inequality persists, but absolute increases uh, in uh, standard of life is there. It's a very complex uh, question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your yeah. time and thank your you. wonderful insights. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank and you. thank you, sir. Thank you. It was good to see you here. Thank you. Very yeah, much. Thank you, Aziz. Thank you. We'll talk later. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Aziz, would you mind taking up a few more questions? Definitely not. Thank you so much. So, uh, Dr. Joe Sebastian asked that, uh, don't you think that the aging population and challenges of climate change also needs to be factored in while we talk about Kerala's future? I think I already spoke about that climate aspect because I started with um, yeah. what is going wrong in Kerala's policy strategies is that we are not accommodating the fragility of our state in terms of environmental vulnerability when we are devising policies, be it infrastructure policies, construction policies, or an industrial policy. Now, the issue of aging, I mean, uh, Arun is there in the call. Of course, he can talk more about it. Uh, aging is a big issue. Uh, actually, 
i always tell uh, i i don't and also to my my other friend nikhil who are also talk uh, disc, uh, working on these issues that what we need to think about when we when it comes to kerala is not about creating old age homes but about healthy aging and we are not discussing healthy aging in kerala i know i mean at least i haven't seen much actually if you come to europe for example every day there is a discussion about healthy aging and the government and policy makers and academicians we are debating and discussing we have institutes uh, devoted to uh, you know identify what are the factors which we really need to do given the context to be have now we are now how we can promote healthy aging among uh, coming generation old people and young people and you know their eating habits their lifestyle all these things we need to promote that actually but what we are doing i mean i think it is definitely a question that we need to factor in uh, because that is going to be challenging for kerala because our uh, longevity is i mean average age li- lifetime is longer than the rest of india so aging is going to be a big problem and our retirement age is very very low actually compared to the rest of the world so g- taking all those uh, factors into account i think i mean there is no easy solution for that but one important aspect i would if i were to devise a policy without knowing what is the intricacies and the complexities of that in detail my immediate reaction should be that we should really promote healthy aging in kerala thank you joe sebastian i think i i know your name maybe i think we met, met somewhere uh, thank you very much for that question and there's a question for you uh, jijin p Mr. Jijin P says appreciates you for a very good talk, but he is asking us a very important question. That uh, could you please explain what the what would be the implications for inequality, which is a rising concern for the economy that is shifting towards a service economy? And uh, he asks that in context of Kerala, how serious that question could be. Yeah, um, in the context of let me start with this in the context of India. as i said earlier and i think i also mentioned in the presentation that uh, if service sector especially the high skilled segment of the service sector is growing rapidly in terms of productivity and income that can only create some kind of spillover effect for example it can create retail services it can create uh, you know some other informal service activities which uh, people can uh, by through which people these people who are employed in those segments can cater some sort of service to high skill uh, service uh, employed people but at the same time it can also create huge inequality because these people at the higher end higher top service sector they may be gaining very high levels of wage working in multinational companies they are highly skilled people they can, that can create and it is already happening in india right because the inequality in india within within the country inequality in india is already uh, increasing but in kerala the situation is uh, slightly different i uh, begin again because of the bargaining power of workers and the let stronger trade unions in kerala so the even if you are working in a uh, low segment of service activities your bargaining power to gain a higher wage in kerala is relatively high and uh, one one um, negative impact of that is that okay the opportunities for locals may decline and the, given the federal setting of kerala uh, people from outside can come but that is the reason why i am again and again saying that we should focus on high value added services where our human capital and education can be used and that will help us to retain higher level of wages and to more equitable distribution of income i mean at the way the, the way in which we are moving at the moment that can create inequality but again not to the same intensity as that is happening in the rest of india so that would be my my initial re- reaction to jijin's question I think Sumita you are mute maybe uh, I yeah, cannot hear sorry. yeah yeah sorry I was on mute there's one more question from Mr Thomas who says that the growth in service sector is the main hallmark of Kerala and according to you it has contributed to the state's economy and structural changes but some economists also point out that the vast growth in the service sector and resulting expenditure 
for salaries, pensions, and other perks have adversely affected the state's economy. So, what is your take on this? Yeah, I mean, I thank you for that question, uh, Thomas. Um, I don't know much about the composition of how much of the growth has been contributed by salaries. But if you re recall one of my charts, um, even though I did not show it, I mentioned that I made a distinction between market services and non-market services. Market services is the sector which is completely driven by private sector and markets like um, distribution system, retailing system, transport services, uh, IT services, all those sectors. And non-market services, which unfortunately with the data which I had, I couldn't break up further. Uh, it consists of a public administration, which is part what we are talking about the government and education, health services. And education and health services, again, in Kerala is highly privatized, even though we have, uh, you know, some, a lot of uh, uh, public sector, but that is also a portion of that is also a private sector. And even though they are not following market principles in, in setting the prices and things like that, but that is also uh, the case. So if I take that argument, if I just look at the distribution of job creation and productivity contribution, I think market sector is also heavily contributing to that. It's not just the non-market sector, which even if, so if you strip off all the non-government, non-market activities, maybe the contribution is even lesser actually. So with the information I have in front of me, I'm not buying that argument fully because I still think that the non -market, the market services or the private market services is also contributing to the growth in Kerala. And perhaps that is dry, driven by the consumption expenditure. There is a paper by Pushpangadan in 2012, which argues that most of the service sector growth in Kerala is driven by remittances because consumers are driving that growth and it is not actually the, uh, the production activity or actual uh, you know productive services that is driving but maybe retail services we are bringing products from outside and then generating income within the economy by selling it in the in the domestic economy but it is still in the private sector not the government sector thank you so much and there's one last question by mr santosh kumar uh, I'm just uh, short, shortening the question, Mr. Santosh Kumar, if you could pardon me, and towards the last part. He says that with the changes in geopolitics and rise of instability in the Middle East, how do you see Kerala state and its people reorganizing itself to formulate new policies? And additionally, he also talks about one very important point of how artificial intelligence would further impact unemployment in Kerala. Yeah, so the first question, I think part of that I already answered in the previous discussion, right? Because uh, what we are thinking about when when the, in the Gulf countries, there is this nationalization policies happening. And I, I personally do not think that is going to completely uh, lead to a, 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 an exodus of complete uh, all the all the people working in the in the Middle East. Uh, first of all, uh, the second thing is that I mean there is still a lot of possibilities, and also I don't think that the uh, natives in the Arab economies are going to work in the in the law skilled segments. But of course, we are not competing there anymore. As Professor Kanan said, we are now increasingly uh, exporting more skilled workers. And in the skilled segments, there is a lot of complementary jobs, actually, there is a lot of evidence. And actually, even in the United States and other countries, what empirical evidence says is that if you put a ban on foreign workers and to a, aiming to localize by uh, through imposition rather than competitive labor market, companies, private companies will find other ways like adopting better technologies to replace them rather than employing the locals because locals are not going to be the exact substitutes for the foreign workers. So I think many GCC economies are already aware of that. I have had uh, discussions with the ministries in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait several times. They are all aware of that. And that is also what we are seeing, right? I mean, countries like um, United Arab Emirates is now issuing special visa for highly skilled migrants. So I think it's a skill that plays a role there. So that is the trick, actually triggering fact we really need to understand and identify. 
Now, the second question is about the artificial intelligence. I don't think Kerala is a unique case there. If artificial intelligence has an impact on uh, jobs globally, it will have an impact on Kerala too. But do we have to worry about that? We were worrying about the same thing whenever all the technologies came in, right? No technology can replace human beings in complete sense. Our roles will be shifting, changing. For example, in the United States, there is a study that was published in American Economic Review by David Otter. What he says is that after the introduction of robots and uh, uh, information technology, what really happened is that not absolute job losses, but jobs restructuring of jobs from low skill to medium and high skill jobs restructuring of jobs from advanced economies uh, low skill jobs to, to emerging economies and high skilled jobs to advanced economies so what we really need to think is that we need to create a labor force that is more flexible it's that is not very rigid and i don't think that kerala is doing that even here actually we are increasingly thinking of actually because right now uh, in my daughter's school they are experimenting a new technology for example with their class how we can how we can make the education future proof in our own university we are developing teaching innovations to make teaching future proof so we want students to be future proof and more flexible and adaptable to the changing needs of the labor market so it is a challenge and i cannot predict it i mean there are people like uh, uh, Eric Jolson, who are very skeptical, uh, who I mean, I mean about the technology is going to overtake, but there are also people who are optimistic about it. There is a lot of debate about it, but I am more optimistic personally that I don't think that human roles will completely um, disappear from the world. Our roles, our the amount of time we need to spend on everything may decline. Okay, we will have more relaxing time, more leisure time. That is okay, but then we will still have our roles to play. That will not be the same role as we are doing now. It might change. That's okay. We did that. I mean, uh, I, what the way in which I am thinking and I am seeing the world, I am doing things is not the way my father used to do. It's changed. And Thank change so is the only much. inevitable thing. It is inevitable. We will change. Thank you so much, Dr. Ribbon. We are very happy to have two wonderful speakers today evening. And I'm extremely uh, privileged that I shared the platform with both of you. Dr. Kandan had to leave because of a personal emergency. I hope the audience will understand. And thank you for a wonderful audience, great questions, great themes being discussed, and also the entire debate being ending on a positive note. I hope you, you, uh, you gained a lot from our discussions. And wherever you may be from different parts of the world that you've joined, managed to join in today, we were very happy to have you. Thank you so much. I also thank the organizers, Center for Public Policy Research and INET for organizing such a meaningful conversation. Thank you, Dr. Arumbin, and hope to see you sometime in the academic real world soon. Thank you very much, and I look forward to it also. Thank you very much. Thank you again, INET and CBPR for organizing this event.